to Open Access Academy and uh, Altmetric uh, webinar, how to build your online reputation. I will just say a few words about uh, uh, the Open Access Academy. The idea uh, of Open Access Academy conceived in 2000, at the summer 2014, uh, as I start receiving more and more emails for, from different publishers about uh, how to publish uh, scientific papers in, in their journals. But uh, what I notice at the most of them, uh, in, in the most of these invitations and training, they are missing one very important component: um, how to publish open access. And the most of them actually didn't speak about anything about open access, or or when when they speak about open access, they uh, speak usually in some negative way and speak about high APCs and and, and things like that. So. Uh, I started discussing about this problem with uh, with the guys from Right Research Coalition and with the guys uh, uh, who were around the OpenCon um, conference that, uh, that, 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 that that were organizing OpenCon conference. And uh, in January 2015, we start with this uh, Open Access Academy project. Uh, there is around like 15 people now, we are all volunteers and what we are trying to do is to help young researchers um, to train them how to publish open access, uh, how they can use open access uh, in, in, in their research and how they can promote open access. Today uh, we, will, uh, we will speak about uh, uh, how to build uh, your online uh, reputation uh, today's speaker is uh, Stacy from uh, Altmetrics. Stacy is probably the best person that, that, that can uh, speak about that since uh, she she working for Altmet Altmetrics. She was working before uh, that uh, in Impact Story, uh, Indiana University, and Public Library of Science. So uh, Stacy will present uh, now. Uh, the, 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 sta uh, the Stacey will start now with, with her presentation. Stacey, the floor is, is yours. Thank you so much, Slobodan. Let me just switch the presenter over to myself, and I'll share my screen with you, nice people. All right. Let's... All right. Slobodan, are you able to see my... Screen okay? Yes. Fantastic. All right, let's get started then. So thank you again, Slobodan, and uh, to the other volunteers at the Open Access Academy for inviting me to speak today. Uh, I noticed uh, watching you all sign in that we've got a great audience, and I really encourage you to submit any questions that come to mind during this presentation. Submit them using the questions box on your control panel for GoToWebinar, and I will address any of these questions that you have towards the end of this hour during the uh, question and answer session. If you submitted a question when you registered for this webinar, I've done my best to address it in the presentation. So today we are going to run through some of the must-know tactics for building your reputation online. We're going to cover issues like self-promotion, fostering community engagement, dealing with critiques and critics, and measuring and understanding your success and research impact. You're here today because your goal is to advance yourself professionally using online tools. You might ultimately be interested in networking, getting grants, finding new collaborators, or you might simply want to be more cited. Who doesn't want to get more citations, right? I am a staunch believer that open access and social media, using social media correctly, can help you with all of these goals. So over the next 30 minutes, I'm going to lay out an actionable plan for reaching any and all professional goals that you might have using just a handful of tactics that are going to require no more than a bit of upfront work and a few minutes each week of maintenance. And once you put these tactics into practice, you're going to feel like this guy here, a superhero. But why spend this time at all? You've already got a lot on your plate, right? You've got too much reading to do, too many grant proposals and papers to think about, too much to stay on top of already. Well, I'll tell you why you're going to want to do all of the things that I recommend today. And that's because your professional reputation depends upon it. Here are two examples. First, scientist Cameron Webb. 
Cameron experimented with understanding how social media exposure impacted the overall exposure of a paper that he published. So he tweeted about a paper that he recently published. He emailed his colleagues with a link to it. He wrote a blog post about the paper, and he also tweeted about the blog post itself. And the result, well, we can see here, relative to other papers that were published on the same day, his paper vastly outperformed those in terms of views, downloads, and social media shares. So he got a lot of overall exposure from just a few minutes worth of work. The downloads, I want to point out, these are particularly significant because research has shown that downloads, especially for open access papers, tend to correlate with later citations. Now, in the humanities, we see similar trends. Melissa Terrace, a digital humanist, she did a similar experiment where she tweeted and blogged about the papers that she made available in her institutional repository, which, as you can see from this diagram here on the right, resulted in many more downloads for her work. On average, the papers that she chose to promote got 11 times the online attention that the ones she did not promote at all received. So there's an obvious advantage to promoting yourself and your work using social media, but you have to do it right and you have to have some basics in line before you do. And that's our job today, to help you improve your game or for those who might be new to some aspects of this, to help you get started. So there are a few things you need to do things right in terms of online promotion. First is your headshot. That's going to make you appealing and approachable online. The second is you need to have a bio in your back pocket, a biography, and this is going to help you explain what you do to both experts and non-experts alike. And bios and having them handy saves you a lot of time. They're very essential for blogging, especially guest blogging and speaking at conferences. There are also a handful of social media tools that I recommend as the most effective ways to build your online reputation and promote your work. We're going to cover those. And a few analytics tools that can help you measure whether or not your outreach efforts are succeeding, whether or not you're getting more exposure for your work. Uh, the single most important thing that you have, though, is a strategy. You want to only be engaging in efforts that help you reach your personal goals. So we'll talk today about how to identify those goals and what can help get you there. The second most important thing that you need to think about is being an open researcher. So open access and making your work open access, as I'm sure many of you know, has a significant positive effect upon citation rates. And also, as we're learning, the overall volume of attention that research receives online. So open research is a very good thing in terms of building your personal reputation online. Let's start today with strategy. So the first and most important aspect of building strategy is to define your goal. What do you want, professionally speaking? Is it to get more readers and more citations for your articles? Is it to find collaborators by way of making yourself more well-known or engaging leaders in your field? Maybe it's to find your first academic job altogether or... If you're interested in that, to find a non-academic job, to move beyond your academic networks into industry. So this is a very personal thing, defining your goal. And you have to think long and hard about what really matters to you in terms of professional advancement, not just the next six months out, but the next year, two years, five years. Think about where you ultimately want to end up and what steps, what intermediate steps you can take to help you get there, what minor goals and goalposts you might have. Once you've sorted that out, then you've got to plan for the appropriate tactics that can help you reach that goal. So we're going to cover a bunch of tactics shortly that can be applied in many different contexts to help you achieve goals. But a common thread for nearly all of these tactics is openness, transparency, and open access. The final piece of the puzzle is to find ways to help you measure your success online. Are your tactics working to help you achieve these goals? Are you wasting your time? So later in this presentation, I'm going to share some of my favorite tools for tracking whether or not those efforts are paying off. So let's look at an example of a strategy, an outreach strategy. So Khadija here is a PhD candidate in sociology in the US. She's published two papers so far, co-authored by her advisor, but she wants to land a solo authored book contract based upon her dissertation. You know, of course, when she defends it and she successfully graduates, minor details. Uh, beyond that, she really wants to find a tenure track job, something that's in short supply right now in the US. 
Khadija decides that she ultimately needs to raise her profile among two audiences. One is editors who work for academic presses, and the other is scholars who could potentially help her find jobs. So to do that, Khadija's decided to blog about aspects of the research that's still in progress and to actively network with other sociologists, especially influential sociologists on Twitter. So to supplement her online outreach, which she's going to do using Twitter and blogs, she also wants to do some good old-fashioned speaking at conferences, which, as I'm sure we all know, is a really good way to make other scholars aware of research, whether or not they're really engaged online or they're more traditional and only are interested in conferences and papers and books. So Khadija begins blogging regularly on a personal research blog that she set up. Excuse me. And she drives traffic to that blog by telling her colleagues about it, leaving some thoughtful comments on other people's blogs, which include links back to her own blog, and blogging on timely and interesting topics, too, things that people are interested about. She links to her blog also in her university email signature and on her Twitter profile. So in addition to blogging, she carves out 15 minutes each day to check Twitter, to find new sociologists to follow, to retweet interesting content, and to reply to discussions that are happening, particularly in subjects that she's an expert in. She's also made it a point to find and follow editors from university presses that she wants to publish with, and she takes care only to follow those people who tweet in a professional context. Um, occasionally she'll reply to posts they make on topics, again, that she's an expert in. So finally, she's got these two tactics for outreach using blogging and Twitter. The third is that she puts in proposals for any and all conferences that she can, where she'd be relevant, where she'd get good exposure. After all, like we said, this is a traditional way to get exposure for her research, right? So nearly immediately after starting, after launching her strategy, Khadija starts tracking some intermediate success metrics. So are people visiting her blogs? Does she have Twitter followers? What is her Twitter reach? That is, how many people are seeing her name in their Twitter feed thanks to retweets and conversations that she's having with influencers? Is she getting many opportunities to speak at conferences too? This is another thing to track. When she speaks, how many people have attended her talks? And were any of them, quote unquote, big names in her field? By tracking this sort of intermediate information over time, these intermediate metrics, she can see if there's growth, if there's more blog readers, more Twitter followers, more people showing up to her talks. So this is an immediate feedback signal that lets her know if her tactics are working. All of those metrics are more immediate feedback loops for her more ultimate goals. And these are ultimate metrics, ultimate success metrics, right? So getting solicitations to publish with high quality university presses or landing job offers and interviews. So that's an example of a really well-planned outreach strategy that's got clearly defined goals and tactics. As I mentioned before, defining a goal, it's a very personal thing, and it's one you're going to have to think carefully upon. But there are a number of tactics that you can apply across the board, no matter your goals. I believe that these are some of the most powerful online tactics you can use. And if you're not doing these tactics that we're going to discuss today on the left, at the very least, if you're not doing these, you're not doing outreach to the full extent that you could and should be. Each of these tactics are not only good for self-promotion, that is, getting your name out there and, and getting people to read your work, but I also believe that these are essential building blocks for creating and engaging in online communities where other scholars are congregating beyond the coffee breaks at conferences or beyond the tea room in your university hallway. It's about what you give more so than what you get when you engage in these tactics on the left. So remember that. This is going to be another common theme that we're going to talk about when we talk about these tactics, giving back to the community and adding value. So here on the right, I've also listed some quote-unquote advanced tactics. They're not necessarily technically uh, very advanced. You don't require a lot of skills for some of these um, beyond signing up for um, and uh, maybe stepping up your game a a bit in terms of networking to do things like get uh, speaking gigs at webinars and so on. Um, I will share resources for doing some of these uh, 
later, I will show resources later on for doing these well uh, towards the end of the session. So you can go out and research and learn yourself um, how to level up, so to speak. Uh, but today we're going to dig into the tactics at left momentarily. Uh, first, though, I want to chat about that last aspect of strategy, measuring your success. So there are two types of tools that you should be using regularly to track your success towards meeting your goals. Those that track attention to your research and those that track your overall online engagement efforts. So first, we want to see if attention to research in increases when we engage in a bit of healthy online promotion, whatever tactic we use, whether it's Twitter, blogging, what have you. So two tools that I like to recommend that track attention to research online are Impact Story and the Altmetric Bookmarklet. So a short disclaimer, I used to work for Impact Story. I currently work for Altmetric. Uh, however, I've been recommending these tools since they came out well before I worked for either company. They're great free tools for researchers to use. So I encourage you to check them out and decide for yourself whether or not they're worthwhile. Uh, both tools are free. So with Impact Story, you sign up using your ORCID identifier, which is a free, unique ID that you can use to claim research that is associated with all of your publications automatically. So Impact Story will use ORCID to import all of your research articles, books, and so on to your profile. Impact Story, after they import your content, they go out across the web and they look to see where you're being discussed online. They track things like when people are discussing your research on social media. They track whether or not you've got influential R or Python software. They track if you've been cited in Wikipedia, if you've been bookmarked in Mendeley, a lot of other things. All of this information gives you a different dimension to your research impact. So it helps you to supplement your understanding of impact Citations help you understand whether or not you're having impact in a scholarly realm. This sort of data can help you understand both non-traditional scholarly impact, things like are people reading you, are they saving you in their Mendeley uh, libraries, and in some cases, whether or not you're having an influence upon the public sphere. So are you appearing in the news? Are people talking about you on social media? And so on. So... For Altmetric, you can look up similar metrics for your own research, articles and books, uh, as well as metrics for other people's research. And this is an interesting thing uh, that you can do. This helps you see how you're doing compared to your competitors. Oh, I mean, excuse me, your peers, your, your friendly colleagues uh, in other programs for whom you might be competing uh, for resources like grant dollars and jobs. You can track both how you're doing online um, and how they're doing online in terms of attention that's being paid to their research. So at Altmetric, we don't track specialized software metrics like Impact Story does, uh, but we do track a greater breadth of um, attention across a wider variety of platforms than Impact Story does. So in addition to some of the social media metrics and mainstream media metrics, we also look at things like policy documents and Scopus citations. You can install the Altmetric Browser bookmarklet in your browser, and anytime you find a piece of research online, you can use it to look up discussions surrounding that research with the click of a button. So another important tool that you have at your disposal in terms of tracking whether or not people are paying attention to your research, whether or not they're reading it, are metrics that publishers provide. Oftentimes, nowadays, publishers will uh, put usage statistics, so download and page views metrics, on their website. And you can look these up at a publisher's website. PLOS, the Public Library of Science, again, a former employer, um, they are probably the best known in terms of making those metrics available. So if you've published in PLOS, there's a metrics tab for your paper, which you can go to look up page views, downloads, and also some uh, so-called alt metrics. So are people talking about you on social media and so on? So the similar metrics that Impact Story and Altmetric provide. So all of these tools track attention to your research. Metrics for your online engagement, those are a completely different thing. Those are social media metrics. SumAll is my favorite tool for discussing social media or tracking social media metrics. It doesn't track how often your research is being discussed. It tracks how often you are being discussed. So your blog posts, your tweets, 
your Facebook updates and so on. Here's a picture of tracking over time on some all. Um, some all can help you map the overall effects of your outreach efforts are having. Are you in general becoming better known to a wider audience? Both of these metrics are complementary to each other and should be used side by side and also in tandem with citation based metrics, which give you a broader view of the scholarly impact that you're having over a longer term. Both of these more immediate metrics, your overall online engagement metrics and your alt metrics, research metrics, they can help um, give you a sense of whether or not your outreach efforts are working. And if you map them over time, like Mel Melissa Terrace did, uh, you get a better sense of the effects of your outreach in specific contexts. So have you just tweeted and see a bump in the downloads for your papers like Melissa did? That's one way that you can use these metrics. Uh, so now you've got a sense of the types of tools that you can use to track your success in doing online outreach. Let's move on to some of the other important basics for managing your online scholarly profile. We're going to get to tactics in a moment, but there's two things that I want to talk about, and those are headshots and bios. So one of the first things you need to build any sort of online profile, whether it's on Twitter or LinkedIn or academia.edu, you really need a solid headshot. If done right, headshots make you approachable and recognizable. They make people willing to take your opinion more seriously when they know that there's a human being behind the tw tweets and you know not a cartoon character. Good headshots can help your online reputation. I believe bad headshots can hinder your online reputation to a certain extent, and good ones can help grease the wheel for your entrance into new communities online. So you can use your headshots across many different uh, professional contexts. You can use it in your social media profiles, on blogs or your website. You can use it when you guest blog, and you can even use it when you speak at a conference. So let's talk about what works and what doesn't for headshots. Here are some good tips for creating a good photo. First things first, try not to tilt your head. A lot of people, especially women, do this in photos to try to look more friendly, but often it makes you end up looking unassertive instead. So be confident, don't tilt your head. The second piece of advice is to turn your shoulders. When you are straight on facing the camera, it can tend to look like a mugshot. Another piece of advice, try posting an action shot, something that emphasizes for the viewer what you're good at. For instance, uh, we see it here with the gentleman with the duck in the lower left-hand corner doing field work. Uh, you might show coding, like the two gentlemen here in the middle, uh, or public speaking even, like we see with the folks in the upper left-hand corner. If you do choose a photo of yourself, uh, make sure that it's from the chest up and don't be afraid to break some of the rules. So Jason here, he is tilting his head, obviously. Uh, Jessie here, her face is obscured. And here's an illustration, not a photo. But to be fair, it's a very specific illustration and, none, and thus gives us some um, sense of identity for the user. Uh, no matter what your headshot, though, I'd suggest not doing anything that screams selfie, right? People tend to have very adverse reaction to selfies. So now a quick note on writing biographies for yourself. As you advance professionally, thanks to the online reputation that you're building, it's really important, I think, to have a bio handy in several forms that you can quickly and easily repurpose to meet any need that's thrown your way. This can be a need as simple as setting up a Twitter uh, profile. It could be a need like accompanying a blog post that you write for a disciplinary blog. You might need a bio when you're on a panel at a conference and so on. Having a bio handy, uh, having it ready to go, saves you time and worry, and it's useful in many different contexts uh, to help you clearly and quickly establish your expertise and help explain to others what makes you tick. So if you don't already have a bio, here is the only tool that you will need to write your first draft. This is a tool that a librarian and technologist named Andromeda Yelton created to help create bios when you've got an upcoming speaking gig at a conference. But this tool is great uh, in terms of creating bios for other contexts as well. Here's a screenshot of it. You just put in your information and it automatically creates a bio for you. 
If you want to create a bio from scratch, uh, first things first, you should brainstorm in the following subject areas. So how can you establish credibility? Why are you an expert in your subject area? Uh, you should also explain what you do to others. You should be able to do this in language that's good for both specialists and non-specialists alike. You should also brag a little bit about your accomplishments. Often, doing so, talking about your awards or the grants that you've received, go hand in hand with establishing credibility. And finally, what's your call to action? Do you want people to read your latest article? Do you want them to follow you on Twitter? Do you want them to visit your blog? You can say so in your bio. If all of this sounds overwhelming, I know this is a lot of information we're covering in a short amount of time today, don't worry. Uh, I'm going to show you a great example of, a, of these principles here, writing a bio uh, put into action. So once your bio has been uh, drafted, it's time to shrink and customize it for various scenarios. You want a micro bio for things like Twitter and other social media sites. This is a very quick explanation of who you are and why you matter. Think of it as your elevator pitch. If you only have 140 characters or less than 25 words to grab someone's attention, you're going to want to use them widely, wisely. Excuse me. <laughs> uh, next up is having a short bio. Think three to five sentences max. This is around 100 words or less. Short bios are really good for conference presentations, writing blog posts, and other places where you're going to be introduced to new audiences. And this will cover all of the need to know. So your current position, a past position or, or two, an achievement or two, and a call to action. Again, directing people to your website, a pet project, and so on. The long bio... This adds the nice to knows and should also sum you up completely. This can be up to one page in length, and you would put this on your website or your blog's About Me page. But even if you just have a short bio that you repurpose to meet a lot of needs and you edit on the fly, I think the most important thing that you do is uh, make your bios easily accessible and editable to you. I suggest creating a Google Doc or a GitHub document where you can store your bios in all versions and update them as necessary. So I keep mine on my website and blog so I can just copy and paste and edit on the fly. And that's worked out really well for me. It saved me a lot of time. You're always going to want to customize your bio depending on where you're speaking or who you're blogging for. You want to think about context, audience, and purpose. And thinking about these things will help you craft a great bio that's adaptable to any situation. <clears throat> Grad Hacker blog actually is a great guide to customizing a bio. Um, I'm going to send around these slides after the presentation. There's embeddable, uh, embedded clickable links, which you can go to to uh, visit some of these resources and dig in a bit. So let's see what a good bio looks like. This is an example from Paul Groth, who has worked in both academia and industry at various points in his career. Although it's a tad long by some people's standards, it's nine sentences instead of three to five, this covers all of the bases really nicely. Each of the things that one should cover in a bio are color-coded here. Do you see how artfully he's highlighted each? I really, really like this bio. And I, if I were doing the hiring, would certainly hire Paul or ask him to speak at my event or co-author a paper with me after reading this bio. This explains why he's an expert in his field, why he's great, um, and it helps do so to a non-specialist audience as well. Let's talk about one final general best practice before we turn to tactics, and that is publishing open research. This means publishing open access, of course, but it also means being transparent about your entire research process, from data collection and archiving to documenting your study on an ongoing basis in the open. So as I'm sure many of you know, if you publish open access, research has shown that you're more likely to be cited. Research is also starting to show that your work will be read more, as in page views and downloads, and it will be discussed more online, on social media specifically. <coughs> Pardon me. But before you even get to the publishing process, there are a lot of other things that you can potentially share about your research. 
So sharing one's data, one's conference presentations, one's software code on sites like IRs, um, that is institutional repositories, or Figshare, this is a great way to get your research out into the world so that you can A, stake a claim in the, your area of study, kind of put a flag in the sand to say, I claim this particular area or subject as one that is being researched back off competitors, peers, uh, because this is my work and what I'm doing. Um, so that's one great thing about sharing all of your data and presentations openly. The other, and this is more altruistic, uh, it lets other people stand upon your shoulders, so to speak. So if they can build upon your excellent insights and this is going to be important for some people, they can go on to cite you, to cite your data, to cite your software code um, when crediting you in making their own discoveries based upon your research or the tools that you've built in the case of software um, for uh, analyzing data and so on. Another important aspect to being an open researcher is ensuring that you license your work openly. This allows other people to make the use of your work um, and to share it and disseminate it as widely as possible. So sharing your software code under as permissive a software license as possible is one way of doing this. I suggest you also share everything else under a CC BY, an attribution, Creative Commons attributions license at the very least. You often have the option to claim a license for your work during the publication process. This happens when journals send you a contract to sign or when you're uploading your data or your presentations to IRs or to SlideShare, you can set your preferred license when you're uploading the stuff that you're trying to share. So I encourage open licensing as well. And finally, I encourage you to practice uh, radical transparency in your research process. So this is a phrase that's kind of borrowed from the startup world, but I think really applies to open science as well. Uh, science in the German sense of the word science <laughs> in the sense of pertaining to all of research, uh, you should share all that you can out in the open, whether it's using a blog or setting up a formal open lab notebook like Carl Bodiger does. Be honest and open about where you failed. Share generously your knowledge of tools and techniques and hacks that have made your research process a bit easier. People love that stuff and it will really help build your name within your discipline. So next up is the meat of this presentation. Let's talk about those tools and tactics you need to truly spread your message and promote your work. There are a number of weapons in my communications arsenal that I found to be particularly effective in gaining traction online. Some recommended tools, creating your own blog, reaching other people's audiences via guest blogging or commenting upon other people's blogs, using Twitter, I encourage you to find a place to showcase your research so other people can discover it. We just covered that. I also encourage you to explore ways to ease the fiddliness that comes with updating many sites at once. This is a class of tools that I call automators, and I'll give you some recommendations for those to use. We've already covered analytics tools, so I won't give into those either. So one caveat before we begin talking about these recommended tools you might not use some of these recommended tools, actually, because you might want to connect with people in certain countries or particular demographics. So rather than something like Twitter, which is very Western-oriented, very, um, very good at reaching a Western scholarly audience, there are also sites like Sina Weibo, uh, VK, which help you reach audiences in certain areas of the world. Uh, there's also things like Instagram and Snapchat and LinkedIn. And these might be better tools to help you reach more public audiences or people in industry. So keep that caveat in mind when choosing the outreach tactics that align with your ultimate goals. However, so that caveat being said, by and large, I do believe that the following tactics and tools work the best for promoting your research online. They have the biggest impact. Commenting upon other people's blogs. This is a really good way to contribute to conversations that exist outside of your own personal network. If you comment upon a blog that's got a lot of traffic, an added bonus is that you can drive traffic to your own website or blog. So here are some ground rules for commenting. One is to be positive whenever possible. You don't want some people's first impression of you to be that you're mean, <laughs> um, that you're snipey, and so on. 
Another ground rule is to link back to your blog or website when you comment. This is an essential way for people to kind of serendipitously, they read the comments, they follow some links, and all of a sudden they're reading about your research and your brilliant insights upon the world. Another thing that I recommend is if there's an option to use Twitter to log in to leave comments or to use a, a tool called Gravatar to log in, I suggest you use it. It will automatically include your photograph alongside your comment. And again, this is going to help establish who you are and engender feelings of trust and warmth towards you if you followed the uh, rules that I've set out for having a really good headshot. So the biggest must for all of this is that you need to add value. Don't just comment upon somebody's blog to get your name out there. Do it if you've got something really valuable or important to say that will be useful to the reader. So guest blogs are another awesome way to build recognition and engage with researchers beyond your network. They can help establish you as an expert and build trust among another blog's audiences. If you can score a guest blog post with a blog that's got a lot of readers, it can again also mean a bump in traffic for your website or for your research. Most importantly though, guest blogs are really good at providing something of value to the community, which is an awesome gesture of goodwill. People really like that. There is an art to pitching a blog post, which I'm not going to get into here. There's lots of plenty of guides online, so I encourage you to look those up. The basic things before you pitch is you need to ask yourself a few questions. One, is there audience an audience that you actually want to reach? Is it other researchers? Is it policymakers? Is it members of the public who could reach, uh, who could use your research? Keep that in mind. Um, also, how big is their audience? This will help you know if writing for this blog is even worth your time. The next recommendation is an obvious one. Do they even accept guest posts? Some blogs don't. Uh, finally, you need to ask yourself honestly, what do you have to offer? How are you going to add value? Again, there's that phrase, how are you going to add value for that blog's readers? This is more about you giving um, back to the community than it is a chance for you to promote your work. So keep that in mind when suggesting uh, and investigating guest blog post opportunities. Now let's talk very briefly about running your own blog. Running your own blog is a really great way to share your unique perspective with the world in a deep and detailed manner. It allows you to get into details in a way that commenting upon others' blogs or writing upon Twitter do not. There are three major flavors of research blogs out there. There are those that are research-oriented, that simply discuss research, uh, share new articles, books, projects, conferences, and so on. Some of my favorite in this arena are Jonathan Eisen's blog, Rosie Redfeld's blog, uh, a blog called Threadbared. On the other hand, you have commentary-oriented blogs. Uh, these are run by folks like Melissa Terrace and Mike Taylor and April Hathcock, all of these folks not only talk about research, but they also often talk about larger issues in academia. This could be open access, scholarly communication issues, diversity and social justice, and so on. Then there are the tips and tricks blogs. How to write a good cover letter, how to set up your reference library, how to do tricky bits of Python coding, and so on. When deciding what to blog about, whatever angle you've decided to take, I'm a really big fan of repurposing content, so I'm not reinventing the wheel. I might recap a, blog, uh, recap a talk that I've given at a conference, and I'll use the notes that I've written for that talk to form the body of my post. I might write a blog post where I simply share links to papers that I've published and write a, a, a short recap of what that publication process was like. I might use the conference notes that I take and I share with my colleagues at Altmetric. Uh, I'll use that as the basis for a post to recap an entire conference and so on. Uh, another idea is if you're in a journal club, maybe you write down some of your thoughts and turn those into a blog post after your journal club meets. If you're being emailed a lot and asked the same questions over and over again because you're an expert in a particular subject area, this is also a great topic for a blog post. The blog posts that get read and shared the most are the ones that tap into something emotional, trendy, educational, enjoyable, or surprising, amongst other things. So take notes 
of the kinds of posts that get your attention as a reader, and then reverse engineer them to inform your own writing. Figure out what you like, and then write posts like that for other people. So Twitter, final tool that you can use uh, in terms of outreach. This is a social media tool that many researchers love to hate, but this is also the tool that I recommend the most to early career researchers and to anyone else looking to make connections with influencers in their discipline and beyond. How can that be? How can it be the most hated and the most recommended tool? The power in Twitter lies in the fact that it is so open. I can make connections with researchers in India or Brazil who are interested in my area of research. I can build relationships with them by promoting their work, asking their opinions, answering their questions, and so on. Twitter is the equivalent of chatting someone up over a conference coffee break, with the added benefit of it being asynchronous and international. Some people abuse these features uh, of Twitter by posting inane stuff that doesn't add value to other people's days. But on the other hand, if you do add value and you engage in communities that are giving value back to you, Twitter is an excellent tool. So many of you, I'm sure you tweet already, and that's really great. Uh, but there are some larger strategies to tweeting successfully that not a lot of people know about or consciously follow. So first is that you should actively manage your brand. You want to be known as a purveyor of high quality information in your subject area. Again, make sure that you're adding value to people's days. Ask and answer questions, give advice when solicited, become a hub of interesting content. To that end, the 532 rule is a really useful one for deciding what to share on Twitter. So it keeps you from sh doing too much or not enough self promotion. Another tool, another rule, excuse me, to remember is to be nice. Make that your Twitter mantra. Try not to be snarky or to engage in arguments or to be needlessly critical of others. You can always use Twitter to debate and engage other people. I definitely recommend that. But when you're doing so, try to always think, how will my words make other people feel? Could they be misconstrued or could a harsh tone be assumed? Silly as though that may sound, uh, it's really important to do and to always ask yourself. And I also believe, and this is another silly thing, that using emoji, like smiley faces or winky faces, this can really help clarify the intent of your words online. So I like to use them liberally, and I encourage other people to do so as well, particularly when engaging in constructive debate. So finally, you might consider having separate personal and professional accounts for your work. This is a nice safeguard that helps keep uh, it keeps you from sharing uh, inappropriate things with the professional network. So very briefly, um, I want to also, this was addressed, uh, someone asked about this when registering, want to talk about how difficult it can be sometimes to put yourself out there, some of the challenges that can happen uh, when you encounter rudeness or vocal critics, or in some cases, even bullies online. And I think that this is especially troublesome in academia, where some people misstate nitpicking and argumentativeness for engaging in constructive criticism or debate. They don't know the difference between the two. And sometimes, unfortunately, it's also possible to encounter things like sexual harassment or racism or other ugliness. So in general, my tactics for dealing with aggressive or offensive behavior online is to do the following. First is I try to assume the best. Unless the person who I'm engaging with is using obviously abusive language, um, it's possible that they may not mean anything by what they're saying, but that they're just not good at using their words. A lot of people tend to respond uh, online before they carefully consider if their words might be interpreted in a hurtful way. So take this into consideration when you're responding to other people, which brings me to point two. Always be professional, but also don't be afraid to stand your ground. Don't respond to inflammatory language with more inflammatory language. It doesn't end well, ever. It is definitely possible to have an impassioned debate that doesn't resort to calling other people's opinions idiotic or delusional. Uh, if you know someone is wrong, you can say it, but try to be polite about it. And always back up your claims with facts. That's the quickest way to shut a critic down. Also, you should not feel bad about shutting down a conversation, but always try to use your words first. 
If you're having a dialogue with someone and things turn ugly, the first thing you should do is politely point out that they're being hurtful or rude and remind them that you're only there to uh, engage in constructive debate. Sometimes that simple reminder is enough to get people to realize that they've been a jerk and to return to planet human. Otherwise, feel free to say, I'm ending the conversation now because you're obviously not here to listen. Sometimes you just have to do that. And finally, if you encounter abusive or harassing behavior, deal with it immediately. Twitter has mechanisms for dealing with harassment on their platform, and blogs have the ability to ban commenters or users. Don't be afraid to exercise either if someone's moved beyond being unreasonable into the territory of harassment or abuse. So all that said, let's talk very briefly about the last type of tool that you can use to streamline your outreach process. I'm talking about automators. There are two main types of automators that can save you time when building and maintaining your online reputation. There are updaters that manage your research, and there are updaters that manage your social media presence. In terms of research updaters, Orchid is the best. So this can help you keep your list of publications up to date across many networks, including, as we mentioned earlier, Impact Story. Orchid is a really simple profile where all of your research outputs can be shared, in particularly, in particular, excuse me, your formerly published articles and books. Many publishers use Orchid um, so that each time you publish a new paper, your Orchid profile is auto-updated by them, and in turn, it will update all of the accounts that use your Orchid data. The other type of automator that you can use are those that post to several different social media accounts at once or that schedule posts to happen in the future. They fall into two camps, linkers, which do things based upon predefined actions that you want performed. And then there's also schedulers, which you make a, a single post and then these schedulers post to several accounts at once and they can do it now or in the future. And I recommend in terms of linkers, there's a tool called If This Then That. There's also Zapier does very similar things. Uh, for schedulers, I really, really like Buffer. My colleagues tend to swear by Hootsuite. So, oh, apologies. I didn't advance that slide. Here's your... Um, very brief information. Let's move on to five steps to making all of what we've talked about today work for you. So if you only take away five things from this session, these should be it. First is to always add value online. Don't contribute just to network or to share your opinion or to reach your own goals. Contribute to share your knowledge with others who need it, to add value to existing conversations or to start new ones online. Your goals will be, achieving your goals will be a nice valuable side effect of adding value to other people's days. The next two recommendations have to do with saving time. So you should always batch your social media and writing time using social media automators to manage the flow of content that you want to drip out into the world. I recommend curling up with a big glass of red wine or a big cup of tea on Sunday evening, reading your blogs and your Twitter streams, and then scheduling a bunch of things to be tweeted out during the week. I also recommend writing a blog post and scheduling it to be posted later in the week. So doing this, batching your content creation, um, this may take an hour per week at first, but you can easily get that down to 20 or 30 minutes a week with some practice. Figure out your goals and then come up with some tactics to meet those goals. During that time, make sure you're also tracking your social media and research metrics. Again, this is going to help you know if you're meeting your goals. Finally repurpose all the things. For example, if you're presenting a poster at a conference, it's also an opportunity to tweet at a conference, to share your conference poster on Figshare, to write a blog post explaining your poster, and so on. Beyond recapping for conferences, there's also this concept of evergreen content in the marketing world that you should borrow from. Use the analytics that you're collecting to determine what your most popular blog post tweets and so on are, and don't be afraid to repost or repurpose that content into a new package. So if applied correctly, these steps should raise your online profile so that people will A, know more about your research, and B, it'll lead to more professional advancement opportunities, where organizations, they contact you with invitations to speak, where future collaborators solicit you with research opportunities, where researchers who are aware of your work by discovering it online, they read, share, and cite your work more. So... Just to wrap up, here are some um, 
recommendations in terms of resources uh, to dig into some of these concepts more. Uh, one of this, uh, one of these is a ebook that I wrote a, a while back when I was at Impact Story, and this offers lots of time-saving tips and tricks for promoting your research and goals online. I encourage you to go out and to get started immediately. Just set your strategy and get to work. Thank you so much for your attention. Now let's take some questions. Uh, hello, uh, Stacy. We have a couple of uh, questions uh, uh, that are su su submitted to, to the form. One, one of the first that I would like uh, to ask you: uh, the question that we get got from Spain is, should we wait till some organization invite us to give a speech on some topic, or we can offer our, ourselves to them, and how? So I am a big proponent in waiting to be invited, but I know that that is um, also not necessarily a um, point of view that's shared by some people. Some people do recommend taking a more proactive approach. Um, one thing that I would recommend in terms of finding opportunities to speak, maybe not at conferences, uh, but there's also always the possibility of finding webinars to speak on, contact professional societies that you belong to or that you think might appeal, uh, the, you, what you have to speak about might appeal to members of that society. Um, it's always worthwhile to find who is on the organizing committee for that society, who might be in charge of educational webinars or um, who might be in charge of the program committee at a conference, contact them and say, hey, I've got really exciting research in this particular area. Is this of interest to your audience? I can speak for, you know, 15 minutes on this topic, uh, if you'd like, if you're organizing a webinar in the future, or if you've got space on the conference program. It never hurts to ask, in my experience. And as long as you're polite about it and accept rejection, if it does happen gracefully, um, I, I don't think there's any harm to asking. Okay, thank you for this answer. Uh, another question that we have is how do you evaluate ResearchGate and its measures? This is a somewhat controversial topic in the field of altmetrics, actually. Some people swear by ResearchGate and they love the inbuilt scores like the ResearchGate score um, and the metrics that ResearchGate provides in terms of measuring citations on the platform and readership on the platform. In general, I always think more data is bad, is good. Um, if you are using ResearchGate as a mechanism to promote your work, to engage new audiences, then having those metrics can be really useful to you to help you understand if you are having success in doing outreach on that platform. However, the downside to using ResearchGate, academia.edu shares this downside as well, is that those are somewhat closed platforms. They don't interoperate with services like Impact Story or Altmetric, so you can gather all of your metrics in one place. You have to go to those platforms and manually extract that data. They don't offer exports. There's no API, which researchers can tap into to, say, build a website where they automatically import this data. So I encourage you to use them, uh, any metrics that ResearchGate might provide, as a really good way to um, help you understand if your outreach efforts on that platform are useful. Um, in terms of using that data for things like job applications, tenure and promotion, and so on, some people like to use metrics for those reasons to help showcase the work that they're doing and the impact and influence that they're having. Um, that's a question that is currently um, also somewhat controversial. Uh, some people are very adverse to ResearchGate and don't like its business model or think it's a waste of time. Unfortunately, I don't share this point of view, but this is something that some people say. Um, and so more traditionalist researchers who might review a tenure package or a job application that include these metrics um, might not look favorably upon the, that inclusion. Um, but it's really, I think, worth taking a chance on as well, because more people are becoming used to seeing these sorts of metrics in job applications and um, tenure and promotion packages and grant applications and so on. 
Okay. Next question. Uh, is the 532 rule apl applicable to each Twitter session? I think so. It's generally, I mean, I try to follow it myself. I not always great at it. And I definitely use Twitter for more than just the adding value stuff that I advocated today, right? Because nobody's perfect. Um, but I do think that <clears throat> in sharing a little bit of yourself and your personal life beyond your work life online, every time you tweet, that really helps to, much like a good headshot, it helps people to get to know you better as a person and to uh, engender trust uh, and uh, respect among your peers. So long as what you're sharing that's personal is appropriate, it's work appropriate. So I might share things like uh, stories about my dogs. I have two chihuahuas and I like to talk about them and share pictures. Um, I might share uh, opinions on a movie that I saw recently. And that's led to conversations with other people in the US who I've never met before. And that's been really interesting. Um, I encourage you to do that as a way to, like I said, build respect among your peers and to help people understand who you are. Um, and that helps the self-promotion bit, the 2% or the 20% of the work that you do that is consciously promoting your own work to go down a little bit easier. People who care about you by way of knowing who you are and uh, having more of a personal view on you, they're going to be more receptive to reading your research and, and seeing what you're up to there. And in terms of the 30% of the work promoting other people's stuff, Excuse me. I think that that, um, I think I might be mixing it up. I think it's 50% of the time, actually, that you promote other people's work. I think that's really, really important. Um, boosting other people's signal, again, it's about adding value and sharing with your networks things that you think they'd be interested in and giving other people a hand up as well to help give them exposure like you seek. So that's, I believe, yes, every time you should use the 532 rule. Okay, and then. Another question about social media. Uh, what do you think about the Facebook? And should we use also Facebook for, for online promotion? Some people do use Facebook, and they use it very successfully. Um, researcher Ahmed Mustafa, who is an impact story advisor, and he is a, a bioinformaticist, I believe, who works out of American University at Cairo. He uh, is prolific in terms of sharing research online on Facebook. And he's built both a very strong personal and professional network on Facebook. And that's, I think, really helped him in terms of his strategy to share um, not only his research, but also job announcements, um, discussions of things that are happening at American University of Cairo and so on uh, among a very interested audience. But the question is, is who is your audience on Facebook? And do you sh have a Facebook profile that is set up specifically for work, or do you also post in a professional, uh, personal context a lot? A lot of people tend to only use Facebook for professional reasons. And in 2014, there was a study done by Richard Van Norden at Nature News, which looked at what social networks researchers are using to promote their work. Um, and Facebook, in terms of finding and sharing content ranked pretty low on the list. So keep that in mind. Uh, I would experiment a bit. And again, this is where those feedback metrics and the intermediate metrics really come into play. Try sharing some things on Facebook among your audience um, and in Facebook groups relevant to your area of research and see if that has a demonstrable effect upon your readership and uh, connections that you're making. If it doesn't, I'd say drop that tactic and focus on the things that are working. But it's worth experimenting with, at the very least, I think. So it, it does look like we're at time. Should we call it, Slobodan? Yeah, uh, let's do just last, uh, last two, two more questions short, uh, okay. except uh, you, need, you, you don't need to go somewhere. I don't, but I, I do believe that the <laughs> webinar uh, software will shut off at, in, in about a minute or two. So. I don't want us to get cut okay. off. Okay, then, then just very short question. Uh, how often uh, would you recommend to update the blog? I think that uh, weekly is good, but not everyone can do that, no matter what time period you choose, if it's monthly or even semi-monthly, to do it regularly, to stick to a schedule. Choose a 
interval that works for you and stick to it. If you're posting irregularly or erratically, um, people will forget to come back to your blog, to be honest. Um, everyone, most uh, folks who talk about social media and self-promotion online, uh, they recommend updating regularly, no matter the interval. So that's what I would also recommend. Okay, then at the end, Stacy, I, I, I want to, to say to, to, to give a big thanks to, to, to you and to all uh, attendees of this webinar. Thank you very much uh, for, for joining us and thank you very much for your time uh, and, and your presentation. Thank you so much, Slobodan, and thanks to everyone for attending. It's a great time today.